well. So thank you everyone for joining us for TENT's Refugee Week event, Recognizing Refugee Talent. Today we are celebrating refugees and the businesses that support them, and we've got plenty of them coming up. I'm Betty Liu. I'll be your moderator for today. A little bit about me. I am the chairman and CEO of DNZ Media Acquisition Corp, which is focused on media and online learning. And prior to that, I was the executive vice chairman at the New York Stock Exchange. I was also a longtime journalist at Bloomberg. So I wore many hats in my career. I'm also a very proud member of Tense Advisory Council since 2018. So before we kick off, I just wanted to give you an idea of what we can expect today. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers here with us representing some of the most prestigious companies in the world that are committed to supporting and including refugees in their operations. And in addition to hearing from them, I'll be announcing the winners of TENT's first ever Business for Refugees Awards. Very exciting. And I'll be welcoming a fantastic group of new members to the TENT partnership. It's been an exciting year. I know it's been a challenging year with COVID, but it's been fantastic to, fantastic to see the great work of the TENT partnership. So without further ado, let's get started with our first panel. I'd like to welcome Hamdi Ulakaya, who's the CEO and founder of Chobani, and also the TENT partnership for refugees, and also Dr. Nubar Afayan, the co-founder and chairman of Moderna, and the CEO of Flagship Pioneering. And I'm so excited to be on this panel with both of you today. So let's, let's dive right into this conversation. And Nubar, I'd like to start with you because as I mentioned earlier with your title, you are one of the co-founders of Moderna, which is one of the companies that successfully created a COVID-19 vaccine. And it's been a, a crazy year for all of us. You've been at the center of it. Uh, tell us what it's been like. Well, thanks so much, uh, Betty, and it's great uh, uh, for, for me to be here on this important event. Um, look, the last year has been a, a crazy, turbulent time for all of us, uh, but in particular, you know, I've been in biotechnology field, inventing things and creating companies for 34 years, and nothing prepares you for the moment where actually what you work on is urgently needed, not eventually needed, to save lives, not to kind of help treat diseases for an extra month or a year or whatever. And that that kind of really, really focuses the mind on the enormity of the challenge. And, and, and you kind of also realize that when you're dealing with totally new technologies, you've really got to get everything right and everything has to cooperate in order for the results that we've seen to happen. So I'm still, and I will be for a long time wondering, you know, why it is that all these things uh, didn't go wrong where in every other endeavor I've been involved in, something always goes wrong. And so far, knock on wood, at least as it relates to the development of a vaccine, to go from a sequence last January, beginning of January, to testing in humans 44 days later, to having the first results that this is going to work in May, and eventually in December enough to get the FDA authorization, that's probably three, four years shorter than what could have been anticipated. And as it turned out, more important to have to have the vaccine than we would have also anticipated because this could have gone a different way. People could have taken quarantines more seriously. People could have protected themselves, and it would it could have been a much more subdued, if you will, uh, transmission rate. But in fact, uh, uh, it, it it worked out this way. So I, all I can say is that we we were super fortunate. And I'll also say one thing on this occasion, which is that I, for the whole year last year, I thought about the degree to which this virus made all of us refugees because all of us were forced to leave our comfort zone, scramble to survive. And imagine when not just a year is like that, but your whole life is like that. And that's that I think is brought into focus the degree to which what others did to help, to provide healthcare, to provide adjusted ways to get educated, et cetera, and businesses to help is what's needed on the other hand when there is a non-pandemic refugee crisis, not a pandemic-driven one across the world. I think that's a great point, and it, it's great context on, on how we look back on this year. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about your family history as well, Nubar. So your grandparents were Armenian refugees who fled the genocide. 
you and your own family fled Lebanon in the 1970s as refugees during the Civil War. So tell us a bit more about your family story and how that has shaped your outlook on life. Well, you know, I, it's only been in the last kind of 10 years that I've begun to realize just how profoundly it's shaped what I've been doing. Uh, the rest of the time I was just doing it without thinking about it. But when you see the same themes come over and over again, I realize that, you know, my, my, my life history, my family's history, I think has in a way prepared me for life in survival mode. And, and, and that then means that when that, pre that presents itself, you know, I've had a bit of a competitive advantage, at least in trying to make it through crises. And and then ironically, I went on to create startups. And then now I actually run a firm that creates startups for a living. And there's nothing more similar to actually being displaced, finding yourself in the middle of nowhere, trying to make do as what a startup is. It's very much the same road. People make fun of you. Your accent is different. It could be your, your language accent or it could be your technical accent, meaning you come from a different place. You're trying to bring about change. You're trying to adapt. So, you know, my family history happens to be, as an, as an Armenian by origin, uh, a fraught with genocides and, and, and many other kind of uh, uh, atrocities. And in Lebanon, where, we, where my family settled, that too happened. But, but the reality is that I view that as a springboard to, to kind of dare to do things that I'm sure if I lived in one place and I took a lot for granted all my life, I probably wouldn't have wanted to try because I probably would have thought there's no way any of this is going to work. But if in your life you've had to bring about that kind of adaptation and, and making do, then, you know, in relatively speaking, and, and Amdi will have his own experience about this, you, you just don't, aren't as phased when your life is somewhat in peril when your professional reputation is in peril or your bank account is in peril. So, you know, I do think, and I've said this uh, recently many times, that in a way, innovation, I've come to view as intellectual immigration and mm. extreme innovation, which is the kind of thing we try to do, what we call pioneering, where you do things that have just never happened, is probably close to extreme immigration, which is what refugees undergo. And that is, you don't want to do it. You don't know where you're going to end up. You just have to make do and survive. So this road from surviving to reviving to thriving, where most people can help you in reviving, I think if you can just help people revive, they'll take care of thriving because the journey from surviving to reviving will give them plenty of motivation to keep going. But where others help is in going from surviving to reviving and not leaving people stuck in survival mode. So true. And, and speaking about thriving, so Hamdi, I think, you know, I might be biased here, but I think you've got the, one of the most fascinating stories of success uh, in the U.S. as, 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 a, as an immigrant um, yourself. And, you know, I'd love, you know, you came to this country without any business experience. You didn't speak any English. And yet you've now started one of the and have continued to 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 grow one of the fastest growing food companies in the U.S., so, you know, tell us a bit about how your background and your immigrant history has helped you in your success. Yeah, I'm um, Betty. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm listening to Nubar. I, I think he's, and since I met him and I listened to um, his videos, and he brings an angle to this that he describes, you know, better, uh, faster and simpler and, and brings, you know, this scientific reason to it. Um, that what happens when someone moves from one place to another, and when ha what happens someone moves that if they don't want to move, is forced to move, and what happens biologically. And it's very interesting. I, I ask everyone to listen to that video. Um, and that's what burns me is because I have the same experience. I didn't want to leave, I had to leave. And that leaving brought a lot of intensity on emotion, physical, financial, you name it, right? What we go through uh, is indescribable. And then you think about someone who's moving under a, a threat of losing children, um, someone leaving on a small boat in a border of Turkey to cross the Greek island, knowing that the boat in front of them didn't make it. And that person has his children in that boat and he has no choice to go move forward. What happens to that person? What kind of emotional uh, cracks happens to that person? So 
what I what I always saw from my own experience and the people I have get in touch with is this amazing spirit, this moving forward, finding a way, continues, not giving up. And it comes and lands in some communities, some of them make it in the Western world. It hurts me to leave that potential, that journey ends in that corner of neighborhood that someone does not get you know, um, attached to it. Someone doesn't get that to, into their uh, companies in their communities and make them fast out of it because no one asked for this, but it happened, but let's not waste this. So my experience is the mountains of Kurdish towns in eastern part of Turkey growing as nom nomads. And, you know, I never thought I would be end up here, here and talking to you and, and all those amazing people. Uh, but here it is, I am, I am here, life brought me here. But what I brought with me is the mountains, is the teachings of my mothers, is the tradition that I have grown with. And this welcoming community here in upstate New York and saying, I value what you bring with you. And here it is what you can do with it. Um, so when that happens, the first you get shocked. Second, you say, oh my God. And the third, you go in. And, and more you go in, in the, especially in the communities like US uh, and Canada and some Western countries, um, basically more you walk, more they tell you you can walk more. And that is brings an angle, at least I brought, and I see a lot of people, others, and you know, an example of Nubar, I think uh, the history is going to write um, them and him and his leadership and everyone, what they have done during this COVID time, this strategic time, uh, is that really change that happens to us that we can look at things in completely different perspective. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that that change and and you know what you've seen Hamdi and Nubar as well. It's a question to, really to both of you because we know that look, I mean, the both of you are, are are role models for 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 not just refugees but for for all Americans who are looking to succeed and and who are entrepreneurs at heart. And I'm curious, you know, you know, we know that we've seen some of the data that that refugees in particular, when they are thriving, most of them are very entrepreneurial and they go into entrepreneurial ventures. And I'm curious, and maybe Hamdi, that's a follow up to you first. You know, what are some of the, you know, why do you think that is, first of all, in the refugee community? And, and what are some of the characteristics that you've seen? I hired them in my company because they were in the community and, and the refugee center said that they were having a hard time funding jobs. And we were hiring and I went up to the refugee center and that's why this whole journey of tent has started. I went up there and I realized that it was simple things to solve. They don't have cars, they don't speak the language, they don't have the training. It's just an HR things. Um, you know, it, it just hits the HR wall. And if you open it, it's a very simple thing to solve. So we end up having 30, 40% of our companies, you know, 19 different nationalities, 16 different languages. But what you see is the energy they bring into, into a place. What you see, a diff, you know, innovation they bring to the place. They can be innovators, they can be entrepreneurs, but they also bring that to where you work. The other one is appreciation of life. Those stories are powerful, powerful stories. And the, and the, the human connections that they make uh, you know, with the, the people that who lived in these towns for, you know, for generations. Um, I, seeing that, what has done to Chobani, I thought that's just the beginning of life for someone as a refugee is not moving one place to another place, is not being in a safety, but having an access to work. You know, that's the minute they stop being a refugee. That's the minute they stand on their feet. That's the minute they start providing to society, uh, mm -hmm. to their children. And that's the minute that the magic starts happening. You know, you know? Uh, and I have stories, like some of them are incredible, incredible stories that people from Asia, Africa, uh, South America, these are human stories, but how do you reverse that tragedy into a success? In the environment of the work is I thought one of the most powerful platform for life to change, these people to start contributing and magic to start happening. And that's the beginning of TENT. Now, we're going to have 24 companies announcing today. Today, I was talking to Joe earlier. 
when we started this with, with journey, just journey with few companies like Airbnb and MasterCards and a few others in 2016, this was a topic nobody wanted to touch. All we wanted to say is this is above and beyond the politics. Politics has nothing to do with this. Second, that words are attached to words refugees is one of the most unfair description in anywhere, anywhere, anytime. And these are brothers and sisters didn't want to leave their homes and towns. Terror, war, famine, you name it, lost, fear, and they made it to wherever they made it. And it's our responsibility, human response, to let them be in our communities, let them be in our companies, let them be in our workplace, and let them shine and let them provide. And here's the economic data, here's the scientific data, here's the, you know, all the science, all the you know, studies that proves, proves it. And let's bring them in our companies and with our brands, lend them to this topic and make this unfair description of refugees to be gone. So these are accepted as, as brothers and sisters. Where we are today with 170 companies, companies and brands, you know, meaningfully contributing all around the world. And we have four, you know, executives here today uh, in, in, our, in our panel is one of the most beautiful collection of businesses and companies coming together and trying to solve this problem and, and bring the attention to, to, to this most um, critical human crisis that we're facing today. And I think, I think in the last three, four years um, in the world of business, there's a lot that's changing, but I come down to one simple thing. What I say and what Nubar says the same thing, is this is so good for business and this is so good for the communities who are doing the things right when it comes to access to work, access to healthcare, access to education, let them be who they are. Yeah, and it's great to see Hamdi, the, the number of companies that have that have come and joined your movement and are recognizing the value of, of, of a refugee workforce. Um, Nubar, you know, we, we've seen a number of refugees during this past year, you know, they, they've been on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis. And as we're now starting to emerge from this crisis, what are some of the recommendations you have for companies on how they continue to integrate this workforce and include them in the recovery? Uh, well, look, I'm, I'm new to this community and, and even listening to this part, I'm kind of even more motivated to get involved in some way and get, get more active because it really is the case that you know, uh, th look, this is a country of, of immigrants and refugees, you know, full stop. Uh, I remember arriving at MIT in 1983 to do a graduate degree as a young boy walking down what's called the Infinite Corridor, which is a kind of an iconic place at MIT. And on the, on the, I remember very clearly on one of the walls where they put posters saying there's a dance or there's this and that, there was this gigantic poster, which was a, which is a native Indian chief. Just think about the, the picture, pointing a finger saying, who are you calling foreigner, pilgrim, right? And I walked by that every single day, remembering that I was in a country where everybody is a foreigner. It's just that if they're a foreigner for a generation, they become somehow native and they forget the regenerative power, the regenerative power from the point of view of ideology, drive, motivation, and diversity of what this country has been able to rely on. So first thing I would do is get people to realize what all this is based on. If you want to lose your regenerative capability, then you're going to lose your generative capability, which is innovation, progress. So I think that's one thing that businesses need to understand. And the second thing is that the, the time it takes for motivated kind of people who are there to make it work, to adapt, to learn the language, to learn the customs, to contribute, is a lot shorter than what anybody expects because they've never gone through it. So how would they know how long it takes? You know, if I, I've lost weight in my life, I put on weight and I can tell you how long it takes to lose weight because I've done it a bunch of times and people never had to lose weight. What, how do they know how fast it can happen? All I can tell you is if you have the motivation, it can happen pretty fast. But I'll just tell you very quickly for your audience because you asked a good question, Hamdi, and I have a very short, but you know, set of important observations to make. I'd say that the reason you asked before, why are these people broadly more drawn to doing new things and taking risks and stuff? It's not only what they do, but that's part of it. I'd say it's a bunch of things. The important among them is that they are adaptable because that's what they needed to learn how to do. They have motivation because they realize they, they have no entitlement. 
the best way to learn how to be motivated is to take away entitlements. If, you're, if peop, often people just feel entitled to get things, therefore they don't work for it. They absolutely have been given a second chance at life. Guess what? That's pretty damn motivating as well. That's a different experience than when you're just born into the life and you're given a lot of great things. So that don't underestimate the motivation of a second chance. And they are humble. They are humble because they're not entitled. So if you if you said, what's an ideal person to do stuff, an adaptable, motivated, humble, driven, urgency wise to right driven. And fifth, somebody who feels gratitude. There is no refugee that I know of that has assimilated and been adopted and, and, and kind of gone to anything that isn't filled with infinite gratitude and is looking for some way to express that. Hamdi's work here, in my view, is purely a product of gratitude. Sometimes, in my experience, people mistake generosity, but the real drive when you've actually gotten a second chance is gratitude. And that is a very powerful force that'll get people to do all sorts of things. So for all those reasons, I'm not saying any of these things are make anybody better, but they make them as worthy, but in a different way than what we're used to seeing. Very well said. Hamdi, any response on that? I don't know what to say. It is the most beautiful description. It's totally described individually me, uh, anyone I have been in touch with, and it describes the community wherever around the world. You will see that same gratitude in Lebanon, in Ethiopia, in Colombia, in Malaysia, in Canada, in US, in Germany, everywhere. This is what this population, this is the description of this population. And some countries are doing right. Some communities are doing right. And some are not. My, what burns my heart is saying, you, not only you're wasting uh, something here because this already happened. We don't ask for it, this pandemic. Um, this already happened. And these people are in your door, in your place and separate them, um, uh, disconnect them. Uh, is 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 really not good for you. It's it's waste. But other part is what's your choice is really, because the eighty percent of the people are refugees are not going back to where they came from. Eighty percent. Some some numbers are higher. Some numbers are slightly lower. So if they don't have an access to life, a new chance, being part of the new community, you're given a reason to create a very powerful wrong attitude. <laughs> Because this, this, is going, this is going to channel into certain things. It is in the right way, in the wrong way. And we've seen those examples too. Uh, but I think we have examples on the history as well. You know, look at World War II, after World War II, how Western world behaved, you know, refugees that, uh, you know, after World War II. Some of them died, some sad stories. And we as human beings, we paid the price. We're still ashamed of the, the attitude that we have done. So I think we don't want to repeat those genocides, those human crises, those no's and closed doors and shut doors. But at the same time, I think we became smarter. But what I am hopeful for and what is making a change now, and I think it's profoundly more powerful than ever before, is young people, people who are uh, customers, consumers, listeners, who are forcing societies, and especially businesses, to do things the right. The second part is the people who joining smart people from universities and colleges and life joining to these companies want to join the companies that they are doing things right by humanity. And with this two powerful force and the new way of CEOs that we have it in this panel and we have it at, 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 at Tent Partnership, when business come in in meaningful way, uh, not check the box, but truly believe that this is something that business should participate, uh, I think change happens a lot faster than, unfortunately, the governments and, and some other uh, you know, platforms. So I'm extremely hopeful. It's in the one thing that is for sure, the topic refugee is not going to go away. Even if we stop all the wars, uh, climate refugees are coming. We will have climate refugees. I mean, that's why this topic is extremely important. So the, the topic refugee is not separated from topic climate either. Um, but getting together like this, sharing uh, you know, stories, um, and, and especially meeting above and beyond the politics and just in humanity and, and in business platform is a powerful way to, uh, to you know, get into this topic. And hopefully this conversation uh, you know, spreads all around the world. And if we are all in the same wave, I think we can fix this in a very fast way because we have enough technology, we have enough 
work environment, we have enough resources, um, and we have enough leaders like Nubar. And Hamdi. Well, on that note, what a great conversation, great way to set the tone for this program in the next hour. Nubar, Hamdi, thank you so much um, for your insights. And of course, we're gonna be talking to many of the companies later on that are, gonna, that are joining in partnership with you um, to support refugees in this country. So thank you so much for both of you and for highlighting the potential that refugees have in entrepreneurship and the con contributions they make to our communities. So now I want to move on to uh, an exciting part of our program, which is announcing the Business for Refugees Awards uh, and, uh, and, and the, the number of companies that we have and, and also the, their, their contributions have been enormous and we're so happy to be able to recognize them. I'll be announcing the first four of five award winning companies and we'll recognize our final winner, closer to the end of the program. And the winning companies were selected because they have gone above and beyond in their efforts to integrate refugees. And they've demonstrated outstanding leadership in one of five key areas. So please join me here virtually in celebrating the winners of Tent's Business for Refugees Awards. Now for outstanding leadership in integrating refugees into the workforce, the award goes to Teleperformance, for outstanding leadership in supporting refugee entrepreneurs, the award goes to Ben and Jerry's. For outstanding leadership in integrating refugees in the supply chain, the award goes to IKEA. And for outstanding leadership in tailoring products to meet refugees' needs, the award goes to Airbnb. And those announcements are a great way to transition into our next panel because we want to hear more from these companies and what kinds of programs that they've been able to set up to integrate refugees into their operations, into their workforce, and why Tent decided to recognize these special efforts. I'm thrilled to welcome executives from each of the winning companies to tell us firsthand how they've built these ambitious programs and stepped up to support refugees. So joining me first, uh, let's welcome Joe Gebbia. He's the co-founder of Airbnb, chairman of Samara, and airbnb.org. Juan Carlos Incapié, the CEO and president of Teleperformance. Matthew McCarthy, who's the CEO of Ben & Jerry's. And Lena Pripkovac, the chief sustainability officer at IKEA. So I'm gonna have a conversation with each one of you on your initiative. So first, uh, Matthew, let's start with you at Ben & Jerry's. Um, now you've been recognized for outstanding efforts to support refugee entrepreneurs. It was a great conversation we just had with Hamdi and Nubar on exactly that subject. And you've done some great work in driving public attention to really important social issues, not only on refugees, but on racial justice and also LGBTQ rights. So how does the topic of refugees fit into Ben and Jerry's efforts? Sure. Thank you very much, Betty. It's a real honor to be here. I'm, I'm really overwhelmed. And I'm here mainly because my, the work my team has done, uh, to be super, super clear, uh, and the work that Ben & Jerry's has uh, tried to do over the years. I think Ben & Jerry's, uh, uh, we are fortunate that we've got a, a, a somewhat of a long history of using a whole bunch of tools that, were, that, flip, that go from ice cream to activism to use our business to try to stand up for values uh, that, that, uh, that uh, encompass justice and equity. You know, and, and I'd go back a few years, uh, maybe around 2015, 2016, it really started to stand out to us and the work that we do uh, on deciding where to put the focus of our business and our act, the activism side of our business is that people seeking safety, simply not being treated with dignity. People seeking uh, shelter, not being treating, treated with the compassion that they deserve. And of course, as we've, we've seen quite clearly, this, this explosion of refugee movement uh, around the world for a variety of reasons. And since then, we've really put um, specific year-over-year uh, -year effort uh, to working with some really brilliant NGOs to call on European governments specifically to protect uh, uh, and to advance the rights of the people that we are trying to be part of, of, of 
of, of, of supporting. Uh, we've done a number of campaigns. So in addition to selling ice cream, we try to use the focus of our business um, and the, the megaphone that we have as, as a business to frankly hold those in power, particularly policymakers, responsible. Uh, we want to be in the business of coalition building. We want to be in the business of driving a systemic change and campaigns such as uh, the work that we've been doing for actually a few years now on um, uh, ending the inhumane treatment of refugees and those seeking asylum in the UK through the detention system that really robs people and blocks them from doing what they need to do uh, to sustain themselves and quite frankly, add tremendous undertapped value to, uh, to UK, to, to the society, to not only the business world, but to, to the society. Also in France, uh, we started last year a campaign that focused specifically on women refugees, that within all the efforts to, to support refugees, women chronically being underrepresented, women in, uh, women of all ages chronically underrepresented and, 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 and in many ways treated the worst uh, in, in the systems that, that oppress and, and marginalize um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers. So for us, this is a natural fit to the work that we've been doing. I think we have a long, long way to go and we're just one small piece of the work that primarily our NGO partners are doing. They're, they're actually really the heroes here. Matt, also tell us a little bit. Um, so that's great to, to understand how it fits into, into the mission at Ben and Jerry's. Uh, tell us a bit about the ICE Academy and why that was set up. <laughs> uh, so uh, at Ben and Jerry's, you know, Jerry and Ben were two very unreasonable guys. They had this idea that they were going to start an ice cream company in one of the coldest towns in the United States. And oh yeah, by the way, we're going to try to use the power of our business to change the world in, in some way. So we are a business. I always like to remind people that these, these crazy guys started a business and we always are seeking ways to use the power of our business or the force or the, the influence of our business to try to drive change. And so even the, the stuff that we do from an activism perspective, all is under that umbrella of how do we use business uh, as a force for, for change. Um, and one of the most important barriers that refugees face is the lack of employment, the lack of ability to, uh, to perform their trade, to perform their skills, to follow their vision, their life's work, to actually add value, to put food on the table. And that's one of the most important parts of commerce. You know, there's a lot of negative parts of capitalism for sure. There are also some benefits like having people have the dignity to work and actually provide for their loved ones, provide for their children, provide for their families. And so we wanted to create something. Uh, the ice cream uh, entrepreneurs uh, was kind of a, a natural thing that the team developed, which is how do we use actually making ice cream and selling ice cream as a bit of an incubator. I know that's what we know how to do. We may not know how to do a lot of things well, but I think we're pretty, pretty decent at making ice cream. And so we partnered with the Entrepreneur Refugee Network or TURN to really create the Ice Academy. And the Ice Academy is pretty straightforward. We, we launched a pilot in uh, 2017 in the UK and we've rolled it out to, to the Netherlands. And the whole idea is creating real business skills. So Ben and Jerry's, um, we, we, we try to uh, put our money where our mouth is, not just our money, and bring the skills and skill building and, and, and actually partner with others. And, and since then, we've actually had uh, just about 200 people graduate from the ICE Academy, and our goal is to actually double that uh, by the end of 22. So real entrepreneurial experience that really kind of goes all the way back to what Jerry and Ben did is two guys that didn't know anything about making ice cream when they started this crazy experiment 43 years ago. I love it. Uh, Chunky Monkey is still my go-to flavor. <laughs> I've been eating that for years. Um, and you know, and just a last question to you, Matthew, is uh, you know, I, Ice Academy is a great initiative. What other ways or how to support for entrepreneurship support for refugees? How else does that look like um, you know, at Ben and Jerry's? Yeah, we, um, you know, in addition to trying to call out policymakers, and that's not just to, to name and to shame policymakers, but it's because structural problems require structural change. And a lot of that exists upstream in, in, in policies, governmental policies and public administration. This other piece that you and I are talking about, that you're asking me about, is really directly related to what we do as an ice cream business and through many partners. Uh, we, we've got partners that help us both on you know, mentoring, training, skill building, uh, language skills, uh, and straight up confidence. 
You know, when you move your life, you know, that's a, that can be a big hit to your confidence when your world's been uprooted. And if you're very fortunate, a person of privilege like me, a lot of people don't understand that. So I've been on a journey myself to really understand so that we can, the team and I can, can, can support this work. Uh, again, I'll, I'll call out our partners. They do a lot of the heavy lifting. You know, I like to say that we're, we're kind of just the ice cream guys. Um, and we team up with partners that help us do this work. Um, specifically to reduce employment. Um, and I think, uh, you know, some of the stats are encouraging is about two thirds of the graduates of our program have actually moved on from the ice cream part to start their own business. And that's actually really the spirit of it. If people want to keep stay, if they want to stay in the ice cream business, that's fantastic. But that's not really the goal. The goal is to really help people do what they want to do to follow their personal passion, their vocation. Um, and about two thirds of our graduates have already moved on to either other incubator programs, they've launched their own business, um, and they found another way to create sustainable livelihoods for themselves and for their, their loved ones. And the other thing I would say is that, and, and Nubar and Hamdi were kind of hitting on it, you know, refugees are the engine of innovation in this world. I mean, it's not rocket science. It is, it, the data is quite clear is that refugees in so, so many ways and so many uh, aspects of all industries have been the innovators. And so a lot of the businesses that, that have uh, come out of the work so far, they include fashion, uh, beauty salons, uh, catering companies, um, that energy to see people do what they want to do. Uh, and bring their magic, bring their personal purpose to life. That is, I think, is the untapped power of the work that we're, we are in. Again, Ben and Jerry's is just one small part of it um, that can really transform the world. Refugees are transforming the world. They will transform the world more. And we're trying to find ways to, to support pathways that allow them to do that. That's terrific. Matthew, thank you so much. And congratulations again. Just stay on with us because I want to move on to Juan, um, who is, as I mentioned, uh, with Teleperformance. And, and congratulations, Juan, uh, for you and your, uh, and your recognition uh, for your work with refugees. Now, you've been recognized for your efforts to hire Venezuelan refugees in Colombia. So to start, tell us a little bit about Teleperformance's operations in Colombia, and also what are the types of positions that you've been hiring for. Thank you. And uh, as Matthew was saying, this is the result of the effort of many people that we feel so proud that they are working for us. And first, let me tell you that TP is one of the biggest employers and we see ourselves as a force of good. We can transform the world. This is a company which main product is people and people from every corner of the planet. So uh, we will continue to serve the major brands of the world with these wonderful people we have. And uh, going to your question of Colombia, yes, uh, as everyone knows, Venezuela has more than 5 million refugees around South America. Almost in every corner in South America, you'll find a Venezuelan family. So uh, like 2015, we started to build a strong network of how can we hire Venezuelans in Colombia? That means getting legal uh, uh, papers to be able to work. That means training these people. That means give them some finance help to get their legality to be able to work. So we started by understanding and getting all these different talents that view life in a different angle and they will bring you a lot of innovation. Let me, uh, the way I see it is these immigrants or, or refugees have a higher hungry to win spirit than anyone else I've seen. Uh, this is a hungry to win culture. They want to work, they want to create, they want to innovate, they want to, they, they give their heart, they'll help you thrive. There's so many things you can get uh, when you do this type of thing. So we've been not only uh, very happy to adopt them in Colombia as part of the society and bring them to, to be productive, but it's also very good people. It's, it's a, a, we have embraced them and they have brought a lot to the family. So a, that's the way we have been doing it consistently for the last five years. And I think we will continue to do so. And, and the, fortunately working with the government and working with other governments in the region, we start to see that all the region is starting to adopt this talent. A, at the end, when you go to the border between Colombia and Venezuela, there are cities that are shared cities that are separated by a border. It's the same family that's on one side of the border and the, the family is in the other side of the border. It makes no sense. 
not to adopt them. So uh, uh, we have become a big, uh, uh, we gave them a big regional heart, uh, embrace, it, embrace them, and uh, for sure it's, it will continue to be. Could you elaborate a little bit more, Juan, on, on the value that they have brought, the Venezuelan refugees, the value they've brought to your company in the last several years? Yes, uh, they have brought a, a lot of passion to uh, give our clients to their brands. They have been a lot of new ways of doing things. They have participated in many innovation forums, all ideas matter forums. They are always giving the extra mile for us to do things better. They have been pushing our company to better ways of doing things, doing automation. Doing, there's many leaderships that have that are, have come from a refugee position. And as I told you, they are so hungry to win. They want to conquer the world. And uh, we and companies get that energy. And uh, by canalizing it, uh, building, giving them the opportunity, and for sure they'll grab it and really uh, be passionate and, and help us continue uh, being a better company. And, and how do you ensure that, that when you hire them, you know, how do you ensure that they win, that they succeed? What, what do you put in place to ensure that success? First of all, a cultural immersion is key. Second, a strong training, product training, language training, uh, uh, and if you do that correctly, those two things, cultural immersion and product training, this could take two months, three months. Then you have someone that's really capable to starting to produce with his self-esteem up. And not only refugees, everyone, by the way. So uh, all of us uh, being well-trained and having our self-esteem up will produce a lot. So uh, giving them support and trust, they will give it back, multiply by thousands. So. Uh, I think that is what is making the difference for us. Terrific, Juan. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations for your success in integrating refugees into your workforce and your leadership in that area. Um, Lena, I'd love to, love to turn to you because IKEA has been recognized for your outstanding efforts to integrate refugees into the supply chain. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what was the motivation for IKEA to start up a partnership in Jordan. Mm. So thank you very much. And I would like to say, like everybody else, uh, we are very grateful and humble for this recognition, which is, of course, the team that's working on that. Uh, and also the great partner we have uh, in Jordan, Jordan River Foundation, which we wouldn't have done uh, anything as well if they were not with us. Uh, I think we have the vision of creating a better everyday life for the many people. Uh, working, of course, with home furnishing, but also working with people's lives and making people's life better. And we had IKEA Foundation in Jordan, uh, worked there for a long time with more of sort of the emergency reliefs and uh, supporting this, uh, this area. And all we could hear was access to work. I heard that in the panel, very inspiring panel here in the beginning, that access to work is what could really help people to move into the next level. And it's so fun to listen to you because I was actually going to talk about our lessons learned. And our lessons learned are so similar. It is the innovation because the, the people uh, in Jordan has innovated us. I mean, we have learned so much in this innovative way, extreme innovation, I heard someone say, and I could just second that entirely. Uh, the other one is adapt, adapt to change. change. Things are changing all the time and big companies like IKEA might not be supreme in change. So we learn about the adaptability and the being uh, adaptable. Then the entrepreneurship, I hear that too. It's the whole entrepreneurship. These people are so skilled. They are artisans, they do beautiful products and I have some of them, I'm not sure if I can show in them well here, but they have very, very beautiful pattern. And they have taught us not just about the stitches, of course, or the, the technique, but they have changed our materials. They have changed our design so that the design can be more accessible. It can be done faster. The productivity has increased. So I think this journey is a long-term journey. Uh, it, in the beginning, it takes time to learn from each other, but the change that happens with that is just amazing. 
So we're very humble and grateful today, but we are also seeing what a great opportunity this is. So if there's anything that comes out of today, we hope that many more people start to do the same thing. That's great. And thank you for setting that example, Lena. Um, tell us how the products have been received by customers. It's fantastic, actually, and they sell out too fast. <laughs> but we also have a rating, and, and the rating goes from zero to five, and these, are, uh, these products are around 4.5 and five, all of them. I think the touch of it and the feeling of it and the pride in, in these products are very high, so they are very well received. Uh, and also, uh, the fact that we can look into the design with our designers in different ways makes it also possible for, um, for the artisans to do these things faster, which means that they can also produce a lot more uh, during a short period of time. Terrific. And, and, you know, you mentioned a bit about some of the perspectives you had on integrating, uh, you know, refugees into the supply chain. Tell me a little bit more about the process and also any of the major learnings you've had alongside your partner, uh, which you mentioned the Jordan River Foundation. Yeah. One major learning is that we, we already from the beginning went in that there shouldn't be exemptions. So working conditions, uh, wages, uh, quality, uh, all should be at the same bar. It should just take some time to get to that bar. And I think that's the biggest learning that the, these products, uh, this business is not built on exemptions or uh, sort of not being an efficient business. It is a truly handicraft. It's truly a business built on the, the way we usually do business. And that is also the design principles where we have the, the same type of design principles that it should have the form, the function, and the sustainability agenda, the quality, and the price that is affordable for many. So uh, the whole starting point was to build it uh, in the same way, but then maybe the training and the capability takes a little longer in order to, for us to get to know each other. But that's primarily what it is, is to get to know each other. Uh, and then the first part of the process was maybe to have more of a collection, so a smaller collection that we could then test and, and, and trial and pilot. Today, these products are global. So what we've learned is that, of course, the volume should be stable, because if you have a stable volume and a long term planning, the possibility to train and keep, you know, develop is amazing. So we are already planning the, you know, the, the products for a uh, 24 now uh, to make sure that we have the flow in the system and integrate it into our whole supply planning. Terrific. Uh, wonderful partnership there. And again, thank you for your leadership, Lena, for, uh, for finding a successful way um, and setting an example of integrating refugees into the supply chain. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be plenty more companies that will be following in your footsteps. So I'd like to turn lastly to Joe and to Airbnb. So congratulations, Joe, for Airbnb and Airbnb.org being recognized for uh, meeting refugees' needs and, and specifically ensuring refugees have access to accommodation when they first arrive in a new community. So this started, just for uh, our attendees to, to know, this started first with Airbnb's Open Homes program and now continues under Airbnb.org, which is the new nonprofit that you help lead. So why did Airbnb decide to launch this initiative to help refugees get access to this accommodation? And how does this fit in with Airbnb's broader mission? Well, it's great to see you, Betty. And it's great to be here with all the other award winners. And um, huge thanks to Tent and to Hamdi for, uh, for this recognition. And of course, I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of our hosts who actually offer their homes and uh, on behalf of our partners who help make the magic happen. Um, but Airbnb stands for belonging and connection in the world. And we, we believe that through travel, you can help people understand each other more, that you can allow people to see possibilities uh, and take a step towards more acceptance and more understanding. And uh, it was probably about six or seven years ago where we realized uh, we had another side to our platform, which was housing people in times of need. And historically, it's been around uh, natural disasters. It might be an earthquake, a um, a hurricane where people are displaced uh, overnight. And uh, around 2017, 2016, 2017, a lot of things happened all at once. Um, one was the, the travel ban that took place in the United States. The second was a trip I took out to, uh, to Africa and the Middle East to understand uh, the problem a little more firsthand. Um, and the third was um, seeing a graph from the UNHCR 
that forever changed my view on this topic, which was the forecast of how many people will be displaced uh, in the decades to come. I think the graph went through 2044 and it predicted there'd be north of um, you know, hundreds of millions of people uh, displaced, um, almost I think more than the population of the United States. And I saw this graph and I thought, my goodness, this is not an episodic problem. Uh, this is something that will be around for our lifetimes. So how might we participate? How might we help put a dent in that problem? And so thinking of our platform as a technology-driven platform that makes it easy to, for people to find you know, a weekend getaway or a vacation spot, what if we took that same technology and, and we repurposed that matching for people who need to shelter uh, last minute? And so um, in coming to understand the sort of full spectrum of uh, uh, displacement um, with refugees, there's one spot where we realize we could actually really help people, uh, which is the moment when someone has landed in a new country, they've been granted asylum. And before they get full-time long-term housing, there's a gap that exists. And for many people, uh, the budget or stipend that they get uh, goes quick. <laughs> Staying at motels and hotels, trying to fit, uh, you know, sometimes large families in very small rooms. And we said, well, let's unlock the generosity in our host community and help in this, this moment before people find long-term housing. So uh, that's, that's how we've been participating. Um, we work really closely with, with partners like IRC and many, many others to, uh, to help find and, and source and vet uh, the, the guests who stay on our site. And, and since 2017, we've been working towards a goal, to help house 100,000 people on our platform. And uh, you know, we're, we're well on our way to, to achieving that. Wow, congratulations on that, Joe. Tell us a bit more about the, the host's experience in this process. Well, you know, it, there's, there's transformational stories that, that we hear all the time on, on the guest side of the asylum seekers, and there's equally transformative stories on the host side. Um, there's, there's one that comes to mind of a, a woman named Susan in, uh, in Colorado who got a call very last minute from our team uh, saying, uh, we have somebody who needs a, a place to stay tonight. And this person uh, was an I Iraqi translator for the US military. Um, the, their identity got out and sort of they you know, got on the wrong kind of list and they had to be, uh, they had to leave uh, Iraq on a moment's notice mm -hmm. and came to the United States. And so um, Susan took in this family, uh, it was a husband, his wife and their two, uh, their, their, their kids. And she had never done this before. She didn't know what she was getting into, um, but uh, it was incredible to see how her being the entry point for this family into the United States um, help them connect into her community. She became the sort of liaison for them as they assimilated into the new community. She, she rallied her neighbors to, to provide support. So neighbors were giving the kids laptops, uh, driving the husband to and from uh, uh, job interviews uh, to get work, uh, helping their kids get into some of the local schools. And suddenly it became a community effort. It was more than just an individual host. And that's what we've seen, uh, uh, the, the magic of this, this program is that once you provide the basic need of shelter, a room, a home, um, sort of people can relax and they can start to, um, you know, participate. They can start to integrate and uh, find ways to, um, you know, take that next step. Or as, as Nubar said, they can start to revive themselves. Um, and so that's been really one of the, one of the magic sides of, of this program. That's a great story. Um, and I'm sure there's many like that uh, throughout, uh, you know, throughout this program. Uh, and Joe, I know you've got a special announcement just for us today um, on Airbnb, uh, about Airbnb.org and expanding support for refugees. So don't hold back. Tell us what it is. <laughs> yeah, we're very excited today. Um, we continue to hear from our, our partners um, and recent developments like the announcement of the current administration to raise the refugee arrival cap in the U.S. Um, along with the ongoing uh, Venezuelan refugee crisis means that there's, there's a growing unmet need for, for temporary accommodations to support refugees. And so at Airbnb.org, we want to do even more to, to meet this need, uh, which is why today we're announcing the Airbnb.org Refugee Fund, which is an initiative to raise $25 million to expand our support of all of our partners who are working with refugees and asylum seekers all over the world. And I'm proud to, to kick off the fund and, and make an initial donation of $5 million uh, myself. And I'm looking forward to working with uh, many others to raise those additional funds. 
I also want to give a shout out to Hamdi, who has been, uh, uh, you know, graciously has agreed to join uh, as an early advisor to guide this initiative. And uh, if anybody watching today is interested to learn more, you can email me and our team at refugeefund at airbnb.org. Terrific. And what a way to end this round robin of, of, of chats. Thank you, Joe. I, I think that deserves a virtual clap from us and our from us and our audience. So thank you so much. Congratulations for your continued contribution. And congratulations to all of our panelists, to Juan, Matthew, Lena, and of course Joe, and for your continued work in integrating refugees into your companies. You set a great example for other companies to come. So again, that was our Tent Business for Refugees Awards, and you saw that passion um, from our leaders just now. Now I have the immense honor of introducing 24, as Hamdi had mentioned earlier, <clears throat> 24 new companies that will be joining the Tent Partnership. Now by joining Tent, these companies are demonstrating a commitment to including refugees in their businesses. And I imagine that we'll see many of them in the future accept, accepting the awards just like we saw a moment ago. Now, these new members come from many different industries and parts of the world and are showing incredible leadership by stepping up for refugees. With their joining, the Tent Partnership now stands at more than 170 large member companies strong. It's pretty incredible what um, what you've all built with it, what the Tent Partnership has built in the last several years. So I'll share a short overview of each company and what they're doing to support refugees specifically. So the first one is Agrana Fruit. It's a food manufacturer and has partnered with Unstuck, which is Tent's first consumer-facing initiative. Unstuck works with brands to make products with ingredients sourced from suppliers hiring refugees. BBVA is a financial services company, is helping refugees with access to financial inclusion in Turkey and Colombia, including refugee entrepreneurs. BBVA is also exploring potential hiring opportunities across its operations and through its suppliers. Bright Horizons is a company specializing in childcare. It's hiring refugees in childcare roles in the United States and is exploring additional hiring opportunities across the country. BRK is a utilities company. They're providing technical training to Venezuelan refugee women in Brazil. BRK has hired a number of refugees who took part in its training program. Carrefour is a retail and grocery group. It's hiring refugees at its supermarkets, drugstores, and gas stations all throughout Brazil. Since 2014, Carrefour has hired over 240 refugees in Brazil. CCI Global is a business process outsourcing company. will explore opportunities to hire refugees in Rwanda, South Africa, the US, and the UK. Claro, a telecommunications company, is encouraging its suppliers to hire refugees in Colombia. Venezuelan refugees have been hired to work as call center advisors and commercial agents supporting Claro's Colombian operations. Concentrix, a business process outsourcing company, is joining Tent's impact sourcing initiative launched earlier this year to advance the integration of Venezuelan refugees and also support their host communities in Colombia. Concentrix has hired 300 Venezuelans to date in Colombia. EY is a professional services company. They're providing training and mentorship to refugees in Germany and has, start, and has started to hire refugees in Germany. Now, Gap is an apparel company. They're piloting a refugee hiring program in the US and they're exploring additional hiring opportunities across the country. In addition, Gap has provided training to refugee women in Bangladesh, Jordan and Turkey, and they've donated clothing to refugees globally. General Assembly, an education company, is piloting an initiative in the UK that provides coding and software development training to refugees who want to make a career transition. General Assembly is exploring opportunities to expand this program to the United States and Canada. Next up, we have Micron, a technology company that has encouraged its suppliers to hire refugees at Micron's facilities in the US and has provided transportation assistance to refugees who work for their suppliers. Novartis, a healthcare company, has provided financial donations and in-kind support to refugees in Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and Latin America to improve healthcare infrastructure and provide access to medication. 
In addition, Novartis employees are mentoring refugee entrepreneurs. Also up is the Novo Nordisk Foundation. They're supporting organizations that improve opportunities for young refugees and their host communities in the Middle East, as well as supporting organizations that address the health needs of refugees in East Africa by providing prevention and treatment to address non-communicable diseases. Rejuvenation is a home goods manufacturing company. They're hiring refugees in the US and is exploring additional hiring opportunities across the country. Salsano Group is a company with investments in private equity, real estate, and technology. They've hired over 100 refugees in Central America and Latin America. Salsano Group is exploring additional opportunities to hire refugees across its global operations. ServiceNow is a technology company. They've developed a training program to provide refugees with technical skills and certifications for its cloud-based platform in Canada. ServiceNow is exploring opportunities to, to expand this program to other regions globally. Tony's Chocolonely, a food manufacturer, is exploring opportunities to integrate refugees in Ghana as part of its focus on eradicating illegal labor and slavery from the cacao value chain. Tony's is also exploring advocacy opportunities to support refugees. And finally, Zentis, a food manufacturer, is exploring potential hiring opportunities for refugees across its operations in the U.S. And I'm so pleased, again, to, uh, to see so many of these companies, all 24, join in this movement to support refugees and integrate them into the, into the corporate community. I'm also pleased to welcome companies joining TENT's LGBTQ Mentorship Initiative, which TENT and the Human Rights Campaign launched last year to support LGBTQ refugees in North America through mentorship. Now, LGBTQ refugees are among the most vulnerable in the refugee community, and this initiative matches mentors at companies with LGBTQ refugees to provide practical advice and also help them advance their careers. So please join me in welcoming to the Mentorship Initiative and the Tent Partnership the following companies for their work in helping LGBTQ re refugees. BMO Financial Group, which is a financial services company, will mentor 50 LGBTQ refugees in Canada and the US over the next three years. Enbridge is an energy company. They will mentor 50 LGBTQ refugees in Canada and the US over the next three years. Also HSBC Canada, their financial services company, they will do the same in Canada over the next few, three years. PayPal, an online payments company, will mentor 50 LGBTQ refugees in the US and UK over the next three years. And Sony, a technology and entertainment company that many of you know, of course, will also mentor these refugees in the US over the next three years. So on behalf of everyone at the Tent Partnership, a huge welcome to all of these companies. Now I am pleased to announce the final Business for Refugees Award of the day. So the award is being given to another brand that we all know, and we've probably used it quite a bit during COVID, is DoorDash for outstanding leadership in storytelling about refugee integration. DoorDash is being recognized in this category for the powerful storytelling it uses to market its Kitchens Without Borders program. In addition to featuring the stories of the refugees and immigrants who run restaurant businesses on its platform, DoorDash helps these merchants grow their businesses by providing marketing, coaching, and capital. So to accept this award on the company's behalf, I'm pleased to share a video from DoorDash co-founder and chief product officer, Stanley Tang. DoorDash is proud to be a partner of Tent Partnerships for Refugees and to accept the Outstanding Leadership and Storytelling Award for our Kitchens Without Borders program. I'm excited for you to see the story of one of our participating merchants, Zizol Cafe, in a few minutes. I was born in Japan and moved to this country when I was 17 years old. And as an immigrant myself, I know how important it is to lift up the stories of immigrant and refugee entrepreneurs and merchants. DoorDash is proud to empower immigrant and refugee merchants, dashers, and communities so our local communities thrive. 
Our Kitchen Without Borders program was started in 2019 to help increase access to opportunity for immigrant and refugee owned businesses. We support these businesses on our platform by increasing access to capital and technical support and increasing their visibility both on and off our platform. Through Kitchens Without Borders, we're able to spotlight the stories of immigrant and refugee business owners, fostering deeper connections to the people making the food we enjoy every day. DoorDash is proud to continue to partner with refugee merchants as we advance our mission of empowering local economies. Thank you again for this incredible award, and we're honored to be part of the Tent Partnership for Refugees. Well, terrific. And as Stanley was just mentioning, I'm thrilled to share a video produced by DoorDash, which highlights one of the restaurants participating in the Kitchens Without Borders program, as he mentioned, Zizul Cafe. Zizul Cafe is owned by Arif El Ghali and his wife, Dahlia. And after being exiled from Sudan, Arif spent time living in India and Saudi Arabia before ultimately arriving in the United States and applying for asylum in March, 2016. So realizing there, was no, there were no authentic Sudanese restaurants in San Francisco, Arif and Dahlia were determined to bring a taste of home to their new neighborhood. So please enjoy this short film highlighting the owners of Zizul Cafe. I did my master's degree in finance. Full suit every time, going for meetings, traveling a lot. When I came to this country, I don't want to go again and be an employee. Let's do something that I like all my life. I like cooking. My lovely wife, her name is Dalia Salim. She is the one who believe my crazy thinking of moving to a life of hard worker every day. She is an amazing lady in, in cooking sweets, making her own recipe. And one of that, I call it by her name, Dalia Pudding. We have to divide the, the task into two. I, I start doing all the salty things and she's doing the sweet things with milk and tender things. I want to do something special. People, when they come to my cafe, to take a very good experience and to feel that they were home. That looks delicious. I'm gonna to have to absolutely visit next time I'm in San Francisco. So uh, in all seriousness, once again, congratulations to DoorDash, Airbnb, Ben & Jerry's, Ikea, and Teleperformance for winning Tent's first ever Business for Refugees Awards. It's been inspiring to hear each of our leaders talk about their work and their own personal stories. And it's been very heartwarming as a council member to see so many companies come and join the Tent Partnership and their movement an hour movement, I should really say. So I'm gonna turn things over, speaking of that, of leadership, I'm gonna turn things over to Tent's Acting Executive Director, Scarlett Cronin, to wrap up today's event. Scarlett? Thank you so much, Betty. And hi, everyone. It's my honor to conclude today's event. I have to start by thanking Betty uh, so much for her amazing moderating. Uh, really, really kept this event going so well. And I'd also like to thank all of our wonderful speakers. And I'd also like to congratulate again the winners of our inaugural Tent Awards. Your efforts to support refugees are so impressive and we're so proud of the positive impact you've made. I'd also like to thank the Tent team that worked hard to make this a seamless event, especially the one and only Chrissy Vicendesi. And a huge welcome again to the 24 companies that officially joined the Tent Partnership today. Thank you for joining us. And most importantly, thank you for showing your commitment to refugees. We know that as we begin to emerge from the pandemic, there are so many competing priorities for your businesses. And it's just fantastic to see companies from all around the world who took a stand today and are publicly stepping up for refugees. I'm really pleased to share, um, and Hamdi mentioned this earlier, that the TED partnership now counts more than 170 large companies in our network. And to any of the companies that listened in and who are still getting their feet wet with this issue, I hope what you heard inspired you to join our growing uh, coalition. There are so many opportunities to get involved, as you heard today, from mentoring rent refugees to training or hiring refugees to encouraging your suppliers to hire refugees to supporting refugee entrepreneurs so they can become the next co-founder of a company like Moderna to making sure refugees get access to services. You sort of have no excuse not to at least consider what you can do. 
And our team is here to work with you and to make it as easy as possible for you to get involved um, all at no cost. Our strength is helping your company identify what you can do to support refugees in ways that best fit within your business operations. We share candid learnings from our many member companies and we can connect you to a network of more than 100 local partners to make sure your projects are a success. So I hope you'll put us to work. Last but not least, this week, uh, Tent is really proud to launch our first consumer initiative uh, called Unstuck. Unstuck exists to create decent legal jobs for refugees by partnering with brands to make co-branded products with ingredients sourced from suppliers hiring refugees. The more brands that join and the more products we sell, the more ingredients we source and more jobs for refugees we can secure. We launched with our first pilot product in partnership with Chobani, and we are looking for more brands to come on board. We're posting a link in the chat, and please reach out if you're interested to learn more or to partner with us. So with that, thanks again, uh, and enjoy the rest of your day.